In today's episode, I really want to delve into this topic of biases and the biases that we bring to the text of Scripture. I think sometimes we just open the Bible and we assume, I'll just read what it says, and it says what it says, so I'll take what it says and I'll apply it to my life, and it's and I'll just go on with my day. But we don't realize how many unconscious or sometimes conscious biases that we bring to the text. So I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about how the fact that our biases aren't necessarily wrong. You can't completely do away with your biases but that you should be aware that you have them and be conscious of where they come from. So that's what I want to talk about on this episode is just taking one issue and boring down to the bottom of what's at the bottom of that bias, or at least as far as I can understand it, and then hopefully make some applications on a broader scale of what that means. In the past year, I've noticed there's been several conversations that friends of mine have had, and I've I've tried to just listen and soak in the conversations that they're having, and, and kind of try to see what each person is saying, and and I've realized that a lot of the times people in Christian, I mean, this happens in the world on any issue, but specifically in Christianity, when people are discussing and arguing doctrine and theology and different interpretations of the Bible. What it seems like they're doing is they have like an arsenal, like if they're discussing a certain topic, they have an arsenal, like a quiver of verses that support their opinion. And then the the opposing person that they're they're discussing with has their quiver or, or their stockpile of verses that they have to support their opinion. And so this has happened twice on this specific issue. So I kind of wanted to talk about it, and I've been thinking about it for quite a bit and kind of fleshing it out. Um, so so what happens when, when people talk on, on, on an issue in Christianity is one person will kind of s- snipe with, with their verse that supports their opinion, and then the other person will say, well, yeah, but what about this one? And, and they'll snipe back, and then the other person will say, and, and it just, and I've seen this, again, I've seen this happen twice, and I'm just like watching people quote verses back and forth to each other. And then I realized these people aren't really communicating. They're just trying to one up the other person with a verse, a better verse to support their opinion. And hopefully I'm thinking an attempt to convince the other person to, to come over to their side. And, and, and I'm watching this play out and I realize these people aren't stupid. Like, you know, the, the both parties and they're not ignorant. They obviously know scripture. They're quoting scripture back and forth. They don't, it's not like one loves Jesus and the other doesn't love Jesus. So I'm like, what is going on? And then I I realize, well, wait a second. There is something underneath uh, these verses that is undergirding their interpretation of these verses. So uh, this is something I've been wrestling with for a while now uh, uh, of what we do with scripture verses that don't fit neatly into our theology on a certain issue. And what if somebody interprets those verses differently than we do? What do we do with those verses? It's It, it almost seems like we'll take verses that don't easily or readily support whatever position we hold, and we either just ignore them, or we, we work around them to, to try to fit them into our, our theology and our ideology. Now, I'm not saying that there's necessarily anything wrong with that because Scripture is unifying. Scripture doesn't contradict itself. So if the Bible does teach something in one area and there's another verse that seems to contradict it in another area, well, either your assumption is wrong or you're just not understanding that other verse properly. So I began to realize that on some of these issues, it's not that this person doesn't have verses to support their position that they ground their position on. And it's not that this person doesn't have verses. It's not that they're ignorant of scripture. It's that they both have something underlying that those interpretations that that lead them to interpret those verses that way. And so really it's those, those biases and those, 
preconceptions that they have about other stuff, bigger issues within scripture that causes them to interpret those verses in certain ways and to dismiss or rationalize or excuse other verses. So, you know, rather than, you know, shooting bullets back and forth, just understand that these two people are arguing or, or discussing or debating on, on completely different battlefields. They're, they're not even really in the, in the same place. They're, they're arguing from different perspectives. So the issue that has cropped up twice that, that, I, that I want to talk about, just because it's what I've been thinking about, is this issue of security and salvation, or once saved, always saved, or can you lose your salvation, or that issue. I mean, it seems to be very central in Christianity, as it should. I mean, <laughs> that definitely involves the gospel. It's an important issue. And, and certainly, if you can lose your salvation, well, that might be good to know that. And it might be good to know what it is that causes you to lose your salvation. Because, you know, golly, I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die and spending eternity with Jesus. So if there's a risk that that's not going to happen, and I think it's going to happen, then by all means, we should discuss that and figure that out. Or if I'm convinced that, no, you're secure in your salvation, well then, I want to know that too, because I want to know what that means for my daily life. I want to know what that means for the gospel, for presenting the gospel. I want to know what that means for sanctification. What does that imply about saying, you know, so there are different questions that this really needs to be answered, and we need to be kind of firm in our opinion, but I think we need to understand what it is that we're discussing. So I'll give an example that's, I think, kind of universal to, if you're listening to this and you fall on the security and salvation or the um, not secure and salvation, I don't know what else to call it, uh, you can lose your salvation. We both would agree that Jesus is God, that there is one God. Um, but here's an example of what I mean. <clears throat> In John chapter 10, Jesus says, this is verse 30, I and the Father are one. So we believe in the divinity of Jesus, and we believe that there's one God. So we look at this and say, okay, well, Jesus is God. And then this is this forms, this verse helps to form a, a bias that we now carry with us when we come to Scripture. So whenever we see things about Jesus um, growing in knowledge, we might think, well, how can God grow in knowledge? Okay, well, we must have to understand that a certain way because God is all-knowing. So if he's growing in knowledge, that implies that he's not God. So you could see how if somebody operated from a premise that Jesus is not God, that he's just a man or a greater man or a lesser God or something like that, they would have no problem with those verses that talk about Jesus learning. And that they might even quote that to us and say, well, Jesus clearly isn't God. Look, it says he learns. God doesn't learn, right? Oh yeah, man, that really stumbles me. I got to figure out how to fit that into my bias and my pre presupposition that Jesus is God. Okay, so we have to work around that. Um, and then the other one in First Corinthians eight, if we believe that there's only one God, and then Paul in First Corinthians eight, uh, chapter uh, verse four, he's talking about sacrificing to idols. He says, therefore, concerning the eating the things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, through whom... So we would look at that and say, okay, well, he's affirming. See, there is but no one, no God but one. And yet someone else who thinks that there are many gods would look at that and say, well, he's speaking in a kind of a subjective term. He's admitting there are many gods and many lords, but for us, there is but one God. So we only worship one God, even though there are many gods. So you see how like your presupposition will cause you to read verses a certain way. And there's nothing wrong with having these biases and these presuppositions. I think that people like to kind of like puff themselves up and make themselves seem spiritual that I don't have any biases or or preconceptions. I just read the text and I interpret what it says and I do what it says. That's a that's another thing that kind of gets under my skin is when when people are like, well the Bible is clear. It says what it says and it means what it means. And it's like no, 
It means what you think that it means. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We obviously all have to just interpret scripture and try to understand it. But sometimes things aren't as clear as just, well, it says what it says. Because our our, our presuppositions shade what we think of those verses and, and, the, and the lens through which we read those things and the filter in which we read those verses through. So it's not wrong. It's just we have to understand what our biases are. So, uh, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with coming to Scripture and saying, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God, yet there is only one God. Okay, so this Trinitarian view, this idea that the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, and God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that, that that is a belief I come to Scripture with. So when I read something like, man, there are many gods. Okay, what does he mean? Oh, well, gods, maybe it's just like, you know, the Hebrew word is Elohim. So it's like these greater angelic beings would be called Elohims. There's these, these super spiritual beings. Yeah, they, those do exist. They, certainly they exist. So we would have answers to, to defend our presupposition in the face of verses that maybe seem to poke holes in them. So we all do it. We do it in everyday life. Um, just as a as an aside, we do it with the news we hear. Um, I, you know, I was just talking with someone last night, and I said, hey, listen, I operate on the presupposition that if the government tells me something, they're lying. That, that is just my presupposition. That's my default position. And, and so if I hear things, and then I'm like, that doesn't sound true, I'm already inclined to believe it isn't true because it's coming from the government and they want to lie. So, um, but if you are, if you just implicitly believe whatever, you know, the, you know, the president might stand up and just say something, it's like, well, I'm going to believe it because the president's saying it. Well, then you're going to be more prone to believe what you see and what you hear. You know, so that's just a, a presupposition that, that we all carry. We all have them, but it's just nice to be aware of them. So, <clears throat> okay. So going to this topic at hand. Once saved, always saved. And like I said, I've, I've seen this happen twice, and it's just the same thing back and forth. Volleying verses that it would be like if you were discussing with a with a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness, a, a group that doesn't believe that Jesus is God or that there are many gods. They're going to volley their verses, talking about Jesus not being God or that there being multiple gods or that will become gods. And you'll volley back with your verses, and they'll come back with And you realize... We're using the same text, but we're reading it differently. So that's that's what I've been thinking about with this issue of once saved, always saved. And really what it comes down to, underneath, undergirding all this, so I'll let the cat out of the bag, at least as far as I understand it. What's undergirding this discussion is what is the nature of salvation? What is the, the nature of justification, of new birth? So these are all concepts that, anyone within Christianity would agree to. Like, we we would agree, no matter where you stand on our security and salvation, we would say you are justified. We would say that you're born again. We would say that you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We would, all these things we would agree to, but but what matters is, what is the nature of those things? What happens at the point of salvation? Maybe even, what what is the covenant that we are in agree with, that we are in with God that we have entered into with God at the point of salvation? What is the foundation of that? So that would that will help shade your view of what the nature of salvation is. And for me, this is where I've kind of had to dial back and think, okay, well, what is my basic understanding of this topic? And then go forward understanding, okay, so these verses seem to say one thing. How can I interpret those in light of the biases that I think are are biblical and scriptural. So, um, in first uh, or in Romans rather, chapter eight. This is a classic verse that my friends who are believing you once saved, always saved. That they'll go to this one. This is kind of a mother vein one. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So they'll say it's clear. If you are in Christ Jesus, you can't be condemned. And yet you're saying that a saved person who's in Christ may end up being condemned and sent to hell by God? How could you possibly believe that? Well, think about how a person who would believe, you know, and and hopefully through this you'll, you'll learn to ask these questions. Somebody on the other side of this issue, how would they understand that passage? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
So that gives a clue as to how they would read this. And, and, and I hope I'm not like reading into what they would believe. You know, I, I don't want to misrepresent um, what, what people believe, but this is from all my study and talking with people who believe this. This is how I would understand that they would understand this. There's no, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yet you can remove yourself from being in Christ Jesus. And if you leave being in Christ Jesus, then guess what? There now is condemnation for you. So it's, it's logical. It's in keeping with their bias. But that would be a fundamental discussion of once a person is in Christ, can they leave being in Christ? So you see how there, there's, a, there's a bias. There's an underlying presupposition that if you disagree on that presupposition, you're going to disagree on everything. So are you secure in being in Christ, namely that you can't ever leave being in Christ, or, or are you free to leave being in Christ? Same thing later in Romans chapter 8. Paul concludes this section by saying, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's like, that is security, man. Neither heights nor depths, things future, things to come. And then people who are secure in their salvation would say, look, your choice to leave being in Christ, that is something, isn't it? Yet Paul's saying nothing can separate. Like, and, 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 and in a more broad scale, people like, does it sound like Paul's giving an out here? It sounds like he's being completely, uh, totality, looking at anything possible. Like Paul's saying, I can't think of a single thing that would ever separate us from the love of God. Yet, somebody, who, well, and love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, if you can leave being in Christ Jesus our Lord, well then, you are separated from the love of God because you're not in the love of God anymore. So, Here's two verses, or a couple different verses, two passages, that people will volley back and forth, and if a once saved, always saved person throws these things at a person, they're going to just say, well, yeah, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, but you can separate yourself. You can choose to separate yourself. So that's a, that is a fundamental difference on what's happening in salvation. So another big one that somebody from the uh, camp that says you can lose your salvation would, would go to Hebrews chapter 6. This is a very popular one. Um, so he says, For those who have once enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of the God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance again, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So they're saying, look, he's saying you can fall away. Um, and that kind of sounds bad. Um, we, and Christians can fall away. Now, the a person who believes in a security and salvation view would look at that and say, well, yeah, we wouldn't deny that people can fall away. I mean, you maybe even know somebody who was walking with the Lord and fell away. Now, they might answer, well, but when you fall away, what does that imply? Are you still in Christ? Are you still saved? Are you still justified? Are you still going to heaven? So, again, that's a, a person who believes in security of salvation would look at that and say, yeah, a person can fall away. No one denies that. A person who believes in the fact that you can lose your salvation, um, they would say, well, yeah, if you fall away, you're no longer saved. Um, John chapter 15, this is another big one. The, the vine and the branches, I see this one all the time. Um, he's telling his disciples, abide in me and I'll abide in you. Verse 4, as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in me and the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. In verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So that, you know, seems to be saying, oh, they're going to go to hell. So if you don't abide in Christ, you're, you're going to hell. And um, so then this raises the issues of what does it mean to abide in Christ, and that would be where people would wrestle with these passages and try to understand what does it mean to abide in Christ? What happens when you abide in Christ? What does that imply? 
But somebody who thinks you can lose your salvation would look at that and say, listen, if you don't abide in Christ, you're going to be like a branch. You're going to get thrown into the fire. Well, somebody who believes in a security and salvation view would, would wrestle with that and say, okay, well, can a person choose to not abide in Christ anymore? And what is abiding in Christ? And, and, and to be honest, 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, you know, obviously written by the same person who wrote John, it's all about abiding in Christ and, and implications of abiding in Christ. And there are verses in 1 John that everyone wrestles with. That's one of the most difficult books to, to interpret and wrestle through. And I think a lot of it is because when you have underlying interpretations and then try to fit all these verses into it, and it doesn't fit nicely, you really have to wrestle with stuff and try to, to force them into your presupposition. And sometimes you may have to just say, listen, this does not work, and i got to give up my presuppositions. So I know several friends who are wrestling and laboring to try to understand 1 John, and what they're really trying to do is say, I have these presuppositions, and I'm seeing these verses that's hard for me to interpret in light of my presuppositions. And that's fine. I mean, that's what students of Scripture do. That's what we should be doing is continuing to learn. But I, again, I'm just trying to illustrate that what, what you believe about abiding in Christ will shade how you interpret this verse. So if someone doesn't agree with you on that fundamental, you can tell them all day long, well, if you don't abide in Christ, you're going to be thrown into the fire like a branch. Okay, I mean, but that doesn't tell me anything about whether I'm secure in Christ or whether I, if I'm abiding in Christ, can I unabide in Christ and leave Christ? And then, so then lastly, I'll get to kind of the heart of the matter, which, just to give some insight into where I'm coming from and what I think to just show you how our um, our biases are shaped and how they're formed. Because this is where, and, and in this episode, this is what I'm trying to stress is for yourself, you have to, to, to bore down to what is at the bottom of what I believe. Why do I believe what I believe? Not just what I believe. I believe that I'm secure in my salvation. Well, why? Well, Romans 8 says there's no condemnation. Okay, that's a good verse to maybe support what you believe about security and salvation. But it doesn't tell you anything about why you believe that you're secure in your salvation. Um, and that might be a little maybe meta and, and confusing. But we have to really understand that. Why do you, if you never really answered the question, why do I believe that Jesus is God? Well, then you might be susceptible to somebody coming in and showing you verses that kind of seem like, oh, maybe he's not God. So you really have to wrestle with this stuff. So. Just to give some insight into what shapes my presupposition on this issue, just, I mean, there are several verses, but here's one major one. Okay. In John chapter 11, Lazarus has died. Okay. And Jesus waits several days, four days, I think. And then he comes to the tomb of Lazarus. Martha and Mary are there. They're crying because their brother's dead. Jesus, if you had come sooner, he wouldn't have died. And this is when he says, you know, that I'm the resurrection and the life. Jesus challenges Martha. Um, do you believe that God will answer and that your brother will rise again? And Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she's a good Jewish woman. She believes that God's going to resurrect the righteous one day. But she's saying right now, my brother's dead. Okay. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Okay, so he's going to start speaking in sort of a riddle, as Jesus is off to do. I'm the resu res resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Nobody denies in Christianity that when you believe in Jesus, you are given new life. Okay, th that is, I don't know of anyone that would dispute that. As far as I know, every evangelical Christian on both sides of this aisle of security and salvation would believe, you believe in Jesus, you're given life. You're, you're given new life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Okay? And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Okay, so what in the world is he talking about? You'll live even if you die, but if you live and believe in me, you will never die. So it's a really hard thing to interpret what he's trying to say. But here's, here's what I think he's trying to say. Because he obviously will resurrect Lazarus, bring him to life again physically. But Lazarus will die in a couple decades again. And then he'll be resurrected with all of us when we're resurrected in the end. So 
Jesus seems to be saying, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. So that could be talking about like the physical resurrection. You know, even if you die, which we're all probably going to, unless Jesus comes back and raptures us, but we're all going to die. And he's encouraging in the midst of that. This is the the heart of why we don't grieve as those without hope, because even if you die, you're still going to live. We're going to be resurrected. And yet he says, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now, what could he possibly be meaning there? And I think he's speaking cryptically, because if you believe in Jesus, you'll still die physically. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't save you from physical death in that sense. You're still going to die. But he's talking in the context of giving people life. I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. I will give them new life. This is the core of why the resurrection is so important. We often talk about the death of Jesus Christ, you know, saves us from our sins or whatever. But Romans is abundantly clear that it's the resurrection of Christ that gives us the new life. So that's the other side of the gospel, that as a Christian, you have a new life. It's eternal life. It is the spirit of God living within you that has brought your dead spirit to life. So these are all things that are kind of formed that we all sort of believe, but we never really articulate and think about. So if this is what Jesus is alluding to, that if you believe in him, you will never die. He can't be speaking physically because you probably know somebody who was a believer in Jesus Christ who did die physically. So what is he talking about? You will never die spiritually. I think that has to be what he's talking about. And of course, Jesus is talking cryptically and spiritually like he often does. And especially in the book of John, he always takes what is happening physically in the book of John and puts a spiritual spin on it. So I think that's what he's saying. Now, what is the what is the application from that? That if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are given eternal life. A, a new resurrection life from Jesus Christ. And guess what, folks? That life will never die. Now, I'm sure even this is not a, a, a bottom of enough basis. I haven't gone down deep enough to help satisfy um, people who don't believe that you're secure in your salvation. But to me, I don't understand how, if you believe that you are born again, and you're given new life, eternal life, your, your dead spirit has been brought to life in Jesus Christ, and then you lose that? I don't know what else you would call that other than spiritual death. So if that's what happens, you believe, you gain eternal life, a new life, resurrection life, the very life of Jesus Christ, your spirit's brought to life, and then you lose that, This what Jesus says would be meaningless. He who believes in me will never die. Well, you'll die physically, and you may possibly die spiritually. So what in the world is he talking about? Um, so this, to me, is a, a, it's a foundational belief that once you have eternal life, you have it. Like, And, and so then that helps shape a lot of things. Uh, just to give you uh, uh, an understanding of how much this would undergird so much interpretation, in 1 John chapter 3, for instance, he says, he who is born of God does not sin. Well, that's incredibly problematic. Uh, some interpreta interpretations say, or translations say, that which is born of God does not sin. Well, that's incredibly problematic because if you're born of God, you've probably been like, well, oh, I've sinned. So what most translators say is, that, well, they don't practice sin or they don't sin a lot or they try not to sin. It's like, that is not what it says, folks. It says, he who is born of God does not sin. Well, what in the world could he possibly be talking about? Well, if we understand that that which is born of God, the new life in us, is this eternal life, it's the very life of Christ, guess what? That which is born of God does not sin. So if there's sin in my life, I have to understand that ain't coming from God, that's not coming from the new life in me, that might be coming from the flesh, from the world, from Satan, from, from all of these different factors, but that ain't coming from my new life, because guess what? That which is born of God does not sin. It's the very life of Jesus Christ. So even that, see how even understanding salvation in that sense can help shade or interpret a different verse. Whereas if somebody doesn't press this belief about eternal life to that extent, they're going to interpret that verse differently. So 
<clears throat> what we believe, and, and I'll wrap up with this, what we believe about the nature of salvation, and I'm not going to necessarily try to convince you, but I do want you to try to understand no matter where you fall on this issue, you have to get to the bottom of what does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be saved, to be justified? If it just means, well, my sins have been washed away, if that's is all that it means, well, then you might be like, well, yeah, but what if you sin a lot? Then do those sins pile back up? And what if those sins become unforgiven? And if you un have unforgiven sin, and what does that mean? Do you Have you lost yourself? Do you cross the point where you're no longer saved? And whereas if you believe, no, I'm secure in my salvation. I, I, I am completely secure. That issue is, is done away with. My sins are forgiven, past, present, future. Uh, you know, all of the stuff that goes along with that. These are fundamental issues that you really have to wrestle with. Well, what do I believe about salvation? What happens at the point of salvation? And then what covenant do we enter into with God? This is a big thing. What covenant describes the relationship that we have with God at the point of salvation and justification? Is it a conditional covenant of if you do this, God will do this? If you continue in good works, God will continue in saving you or forgiving you or whatever and washing your sins away? Or is it a covenant that is an unconditional covenant? We've entered into it by faith, and then God says, I've taken care of the rest. I've handled this covenant, I've secured it, and I will make it happen. And guys, I would just end with, I think it's the latter. And in Galatians, that's the covenant that Paul points us to. In our relationship with God, in our relationship of grace with God, he points to the Abrahamic covenant, where he says, Abraham believed God. That's all Abraham did. And then he entered into a covenant in which God made a covenant with himself saying, I will bring this to pass. I will give you these descendants, Abraham. I will give you a land. I will bless the world through you. And Abraham, it has nothing to do with your faithfulness. You are not involved in this covenant. If you read in Galatians, he, he put Abraham to sleep and was like, you're not, you're not taking part in this covenant. And God himself entered into this covenant with himself to secure this covenant this covenant. So those are just things that underlie. And, and again, I, I'm just hoping I'm, I, I'm whetting your appetite to realize, oh, wow, you know, interpreting the Bible isn't just as clear cut as, well, the Bible says it. So that's what it says. No, you have something underlying that, that is shading your interpretation. And that's not a bad thing. You just have to be aware of what those presuppositions are. So uh, think about those things. Think a little bit deeper on the things that you believe and why you believe what you believe. Thank you. While Faith and Focus is a ministry of in faith, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast don't necessarily reflect the views and opinions of in faith as a mission. If you like what you heard in this episode, why don't you become a monthly supporter of the ministry? It really helps me out $10 a month or whatever the Lord lays on your heart. So if you're interested in becoming a partner, uh, you can text the word discipleship to 41444 or head over to infaith.org backslash Dennis dash Sotherby. And if you have any questions or topics that you would like me to address on a future episode of Faith and Focus, why don't you shoot me an email? You can email me at Dennis Sotherby at infaith.org. Just put in the subject line, question for Faith and Focus or something like that. Uh, so I can see it, know that it's from you, and know that it's an issue that you'd like me to address.